Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is a review of Rebel Moon House of the Blood Axe number two from Titan Comics. In this issue, the Blood Axe siblings get a little bit closer to becoming the rebels they will eventually be known for when uh, Darian seeks out a different path to resolving the uh, assault on his homeworld than his father's. Uh, but before we get started, please like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell for notification. Your thumbs up helps keep us going, and your attention would be greatly appreciated. Before we get into the issue, let's talk about the credits. The story is by Zack Snyder, who is also the creator of the Rubble Moon property and the director of the Netflix film on which this story is based. The script is written by Magdalene Visaggio, art by Clark Bint, colors by Francesco Sagala, and the letters by Anne World Designs, Jamie or Hame, I'm not sure which it is, but forgive me if I pronounce it incorrectly. The main cover, or cover A, is by Daniel Warren Johnson, who we like a lot here. We're fans of Daniel Warren Johnson. So let's recap issue number one. In the previous issue, uh, we were introduced to Darian and Debra before they were become known as these sort of intergalactic fugitives and rebels who are blamed for the uh, overthrow of the mother world government. And, it, and the way this sort of comes to a head is Colonel Helica uh, arrives from the with a mother world dreadnought, which is a large battleship in orbit, claiming that the rebels who are responsible for the king's recent death are hiding out in the black mountains of their home world of Shasu. Uh, the king, the King Bloodaxe, who is Darian and Devra's father, is given an ultimatum: hunt down the rebels and kill them, and to put them, to bring them to justice for the king's death, or we will obliterate the planet. Which is <laughs> kind of kind of a steep ultimatum there. So in this issue, what happens? Uh, Darian and Devra are sparring and practicing and trying to figure out. What is their place in this sort of new political landscape now that the king is dead? And they are at odds with each other over what their father must do. Uh, Darian believes that it is better to uh, wipe out the rebels and just be done with it for the sake of their homeworld and in loyalty to the mother world. Uh, so that way they can um, essentially maintain their status as a loyal war a planet. Uh, Devra believes that if the king, who is their father, goes after the rebels and destroys them and obliterates their entire clan, that effectively he is doing the king, the, the mother world's dirty work for them. Um, Colonel Helica, who's up in the dreadnought up in space, is basically biding her time, letting the, the folks below stew and figure out what to do. But either way, she knows she's going to get her pound of flesh. She knows she, she, bloodshed will occur. And she's just trying to figure out who's going to bite first to do the, the mother world's dirty work for them. Uh, in the course of this issue, uh, Devra and Darian essentially come to blows as they spar, but also verbal spars, uh, sparring and emotional sparring over who's right and what's the best course of action. Eventually, Devra uh, confronts her father saying, if you go do this and you kill those rebels, you're essentially killing your own people for the sake of loyalty to uh, the mother world who never really cared about Shasu and, and would do anything that they chose, could, that they'll do anything to the planet that they see fit, which means that you're choosing essentially anarch, uh, fascism and authoritarianism over the loyalty to your own people. And interspersed in the story, we get flashbacks to when King, uh, when the king was coming up as a young prince, and how his father tried to instill in him uh, a, a a loyalty and a sense of connection to Shasu, which is their world, and to the people of Shasu, uh, and trying to instill in him a, a sense of uh, belonging and uh, deep connection and bonding to the planet. So even though the king is, is effectively a half-breed and his uh, lineage comes from off-world when he's on the planet of Shasu. His father did everything he could in the very beginning to instill in him a sense of belonging and peace. There's a lot of parallels here in that part of the story that mimic uh, Paul Atreides and Dune as far as how they 
were eventually brought to Arrakis and then made part of Arrakis as part of a, a bloodline, a legacy, if not, or a legacy not by blood necessarily, but by spirit and belonging. So there's definitely a lot of parallels to other types of science fiction stories that permeate this entire issue and so far the series as a whole. And if you watched Rebel Moon film on Netflix, you see the same thing as well. So eventually what happens, Darian strikes out on his own to uh, try and make uh, try and meet with the rebels and try to find out what really happened and try to investigate who's really at fault for the king's death. Uh, Devra, despite her better judgment because her confrontation with her father ended badly, she goes after them, goes after her brother, Darian, and the two eventually uh, meet up with a bunch of cutthroats and rebels in the Black Mountains. But whether or not they are enemies or allies is yet remains to be seen depending on the cliffhanger and, and how you choose to interpret what happens next. So we'll see. Uh, interesting fact, as far as the timeline of where this comic series fits in conjunction with the Netflix film written and directed by next Zack Snyder, this definitely comes before the film and it focuses on the blood X characters who are in the film only briefly. So I think what that's one of the odd criticisms of this series is it focuses on two characters who are sort of almost incidental to the film, which is the foundation of which this comic series is based. So you're sort of getting a, a, an issue long spinoff, but based on side characters who barely have anything to do with the, the film they're in it and they they're used as a plot device to justify some things that are happening with the soldiers in the film. But, uh, I mean, but you barely see them and, and they, at least the, the son, Darian, dies in the film. Sorry to spoil it if you haven't seen the film. He, he dies in the film. So it's almost kind of like, okay, why are we doing a spinoff for characters who are just a plot device who eventually die? I don't know. It was an odd choice, but here we are. So timeline-wise, timeline this, this happens before the events of the film, possibly by a couple of years at least. So we'll see how that goes as far as where it dovetails in eventually when this, when this spinoff wraps up. Okay, so what do we like about Rebel Moon uh, House of the Blood Axe number two? Uh, you do get a lot of sense of the political turmoil and intrigue when you have uh, the prince and the princess effectively are at ad odds with each other about how to handle this uh, planet um, threatening uh, event with the arrival of Colonel Helica and the Dreadnought. And, and it also a conflict between uh, the siblings and their father, and also the conflict between the planet Shasu and where it fits in the galactic landscape of the mother world and where it all kind of fits together. And so you definitely feel like there's some kind of um, change in the wind that it's all about is the spirit of upheaval and rebellion and, and nobody's quite sure what's going to happen next, but it feels like the situation is boiling over because everybody's tense. Everybody's on the verge of about uh, of fighting and you could almost, you almost get the strong belief or the impression that a war is about to break loose, just things boiling over uh, from the oppression of the mother world lasting too long. And now with the King's death and then the rebels and it all kind of, hitting all at, at some nexus point. So you get that sense of things are about to boil over uh, due to long standing uh, negative feelings and hostility and conflict. Uh, negatives. The plot is very disjointed. The, if we're, if we're kind of focusing on what, what makes sense about this series and what do we like and what we didn't like, what we didn't like is that the plot feels very disjointed. Uh, you're jumping back and forth between the present and the past. Uh, with a lot of the flashbacks for the king as a young prince. But it's not quite clear why, where and why and how those events tie into what's the current event other than developing the king's feelings about Shasu, which we sort of is nice, but don't really necessarily play into the conflict at hand other than to, in, to inform the readers about the king's motivation for not uh, making a quick decision because he understands what's at stake. But past that, it's like you spend a lot of time on these flashbacks to underscore how he would, didn't feel that connection until much later to Shasu. And then uh, the uh, a lot of the language and the dialogue is clunky and weird because it, so much of that dialogue, especially when the, when the uh, young prince encounters a shaman who sort of informs him of his destiny, says, well, you could either be good or bad. And there's a lot of references to gods and um, spiritual entities and 
uh, people, places, and things that we have no background on, that we have no connection to, or a contextual way to kind of uh, bring it into the story itself. So there's a lot of referential information in the dialogue that does it, that's meaningless. And then, and then when they, when when the shamans bring up this information about you know certain gods and certain places and certain people. You want to make it it's supposed to it's meant to feel like it's important, but it doesn't really feel important because you have no idea what they're talking about. And then when you couple that with a uh, disjointed you know plot development where there's jumping back and forth and it doesn't quite flow very well, it, it writing wise it just doesn't come together. It's just a lot of bits of pieces of information that are cobbled together, but it doesn't flow, it doesn't feel cohesive, it doesn't feel coherent, and you're just sort of like, eh, okay. And and frankly, honestly, because so much of this is about trying to give you background information, trying to, you know, tie all these thought, all these plot threads together and all these character backstories together. Honestly, it, it starts to become tedious after a while. And, and, and the, ult- the end result is you have a, a comic that's uh, frankly boring. There's not a lot of big developments that happen here. There's not a lot of, there's, there are no wow moments and it's all sort of info dump, um, character building. That's not very interesting developments with flashbacks inside uh characters and language and just it just doesn't fit together very well and it's just sort of a tedious read uh what do we think about the art from uh clark bind overall it's okay uh it didn't blow me away the color palette is very muted and that's due to francesco sagala's choice of coloring uh it's not bad it's just it's just sort of there it's just kind of i won't say mediocre but just it doesn't inspire anything it's very lacking in uh pop and it doesn't grab you i mean some of the the when the siblings darian and devra are fighting during a sparring section that's interesting there's some energy there and it's kind of cool but beyond that it's a lot of people standing around talking and thinking and wondering and considering and it's just not very interesting. So art-wise, it's okay. It's competent, but it's it's, it's nothing there that's going to grab you. So final thoughts. What do we think about Rebel Moon, House of the Blood Axe number two from Titan Comics? Uh, it's really, this this spinoff series is really just for completionists who are really into Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon. If you love that movie and you just want to have, you want everything around it uh, because it, it kind of hits your point of passion, then pick up the series and, and it'll just give you some, it just give you like a little side story that is good for completionists. For everybody else, if you're looking for a great sci-fi story, this kind of really isn't it. It's it's okay, but it's it's just it's definitely not going to be a, 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 a hit your sci-fi sweet spot. Uh, and the art is okay, uh, but disjointed story, uh, not very interesting characters, clunky dialogue, and just a generally tedious, kind of almost boring comic. It's good for completions for Zack Snyder fans, but that's about it. So therefore, we're going to give Rebel Moon House of the Blood Axe number two a solid 6.5 out of 10. So I hope you enjoyed this review. Before you leave, please like, share, comment, subscribe to Comic Opinions for more comic reviews and analysis every week. I'm Gabe Hernandez, your publisher in the IC. Have a great day.